My name is Tim Hawkinson, and I serve as Associate Pastor of Youth and Worship in Turlock, California. Central Valley, about 90 miles east of San Francisco, might put us on the map for you. And I'd just like to share a couple of things. I took a class back in 2006, and it destroyed me. I don't know if you've ever read something or encountered something, or maybe even a person, who when you think back upon those times or those people are visual reminders, a, a, a liminal marker where you know beyond that point you'll never be the same. This for me was a class called something like moving from hostility to hospitality. And maybe some of you in this room were in that class with me. And in the class we discussed ways to rediscover the lost art of Christian hospitality, welcoming the other in our midst. And around that same time, my wife and I were deeply moved by a covenant missionary that we heard come speak at our church. He was a Californian guy, but he spoke English with a Colombian accent that had been picked up while serving street kids over many years. Working so hard to learn another person's language and to learn another person's culture that it literally impacts the way we speak our own language and live our own culture. I don't know if there's a better image than that of what incarnational ministry is really all about. And it's what we're taught to do when we serve teens. We earn the right to be heard by learning a culture that as we age is increasingly unfamiliar to us. As God, uh, as God led us, my wife and I, we, we followed and soon we were serving a congregation in a diverse neighborhood full of need that we chose to see as potential. 120 years old, the church is in the part of town where homes are sturdy enough to endure decades of abuse. And we share our church campus with a sister church a uh, sister Spanish-speaking church with whom we mostly play nice, even when communication is at a minimum. But lately, i got to confess to you guys, I've been really frustrated and confused because after nearly 23 years in this partnership, I feel like our churches ought to be so unified that they're a model for others throughout the covenant and the kingdom. And I feel personally that after nearly eight years in my setting, I ought to really truly get and, and understand the hearts and the needs of the kids that I serve, but in many ways, that's just not the case. And that leaves me to question why. And in all honesty, I have to say that my ego has sustained blunt force trauma following tons of failed attempts to fulfill the godly ideal of intercultural unity, but trying on my own terms and timetable. The Word of God tells us that in Jesus Christ, and we just live this through in the Christmas season, the incarnation, that in Jesus Christ, God became flesh and dwelt among us. What a scandalous concept is that? And we're not only told that God incarnated himself, which is a, a holy, crazy, mysterious idea, but further, that those who he came to, his own people, did not receive him. If there's one thing that I feel like I'm learning in the last couple of months, it would be this. That we are not only given the task of making disciples of all people, nor are we only told that unity is, is available through Christ across all kinds of human division, but we're given the only model for entering into a healthy relationship with someone who is truly other than us, and it's this. By approaching the other in humility, while choosing to risk rejection. What I think I'm learning is that our heart has got to be on the line if we want to do incarnational ministry in a way that looks like Jesus. But often, and I'm going to speak for myself, I'm going to say we, I'm going to speak for me, maybe it applies to you. Often I believe that we mitigate this risk of rejection by self-assertion, asserting ourselves, putting our perspectives out there, thinking that our reading and maybe our secondhand knowledge are as good as firsthand experience with people we're trying to serve. Sometimes we mitigate the risk by forming assumptions about the people we're trying to serve and by refusing to listen in favor of controlling the dialogue. And then we wonder why our partnership maybe isn't as strong as it should be. Because that's by definition not a partnership. What this looks like in my context is me moving out of North Park Seminary and into a mostly low-income Hispanic neighborhood. I grew up middle class, and I'm very white, German-Swedish. And this neighborhood that had its own values and self-understanding, 
But what I did is I moved in and I began doing ministry out of the assumptions that I had about at-risk youth in general. So rather than beginning the ministry at table, sitting with families, breaking bread, listening, allowing the other to define herself, and in that scenario, I become the expert. I become the savior. I become the one with the answers. Now, of course, I don't truly become that, but I think of myself in that way, and that's an awful burden to bear, and it's unrealistic, and it's not true. And while my diagnosis of the situation or my assessment of the need hasn't always been wrong, actually sometimes it's been quite right, uh, the way that I got there, my approach has robbed the other of her or his dignity and has built a wall between us. Franciscan priest and author Richard Rohr reminded me just on the flight over here in his book, uh, Breathing, Learning to Breathe Underwater, Spirituality, the 12 Steps, fantastic. He reminded me of the cliche that has sometimes been used, that to understand someone requires standing under them. In other words, giving up our control. And sometimes I think rather than truly seeking to understand the other, we look past or we speak over or we assume our way straight through people. And we're talking about precious and gifted and God-created and God's own image-bearing people. Right over them, right around them, right through them. And the sickness is that if we're not careful, we can objectify people. We can objectify the other in the name of the Lord. Another image that comes to me from the scripture is the Exodus story, the Exodus narrative, in which God doesn't show up and start by just delivering people. The scripture tells us that God saw the, the Israelites' plight in Egypt. He heard their cries. He was moved to compassion. And then he set them free. Now, please hear me. I'm not trying to stand up here and say that in your context, as you reach out to the other, it's your job to think of yourself as the Savior, compassionately listening and ready to deliver. That's the beginning of the problem, not the solution. But what I do want to, the point I do want to make through this text is this. The actions on behalf of others that we take must follow seeing, hearing, and laying our hearts on the line. It's only then that we have any opportunity to know what needs to be done. And this is what this has to do with reimagining youth ministry specifically. Diversity exists everywhere. And the reason is because our experience is never normative for all the people that we encounter. And I think we need to own that. The approach to youth ministry needed for you, for me, is as diverse, as varied, as numerous as the populations that we serve. And I know that sometimes we can get worn out by some of the dialogue around inter-ethnic relationships, around compassion, mercy, and justice, if it seems irrelevant to our specific setting. But we're talking about something more foundational. We're talking about being in relationship with those who are other than yourself, which is basically everyone. So who is it in your context? Is it maybe another ethnic group that you haven't dared to try to know? Is it uh, a senior pastor that you serve under? Is it some junior high kids that after all these years you just can't figure them out? Is it parents who act in ways that just absolutely baffle you? Fill in the blank, remembering that our very first relationship with Jesus Christ is always an embracing of the one who is wholly other than ourselves. H-O-L-Y, wholly other, over whom we have no control, and of whom we can never uh, 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 assume complete and total understanding. And we know how jacked up our relationships become with God and with people when we assume to know them completely. And this is the point of my seven minutes. It, it all kind of boils down to this, that I really believe being in authentic relationship with those who are other than us makes us better Christ followers. Because it provides opportunity to surrender our control and to, in vulnerability, seek to forge a friendship. Cross-cultural partnerships are not a commodity. And I really want to be clear about that. That's been a huge thing on my heart. And, and I hope that you identify with that, that developing a relationship with someone who is other than me, whatever that cultural gap is, is not a commodity, but it's a pathway to discipleship which will continually and blessedly bruise our egos. We actually need that. That's a healthy wounding sometimes. What if our students and their friends saw in our ministries 
people who are working so hard to learn another language and culture that it impacted the way that they spoke and lived their own. I believe that this is something our students need and which their diverse world is demanding. Amen? Amen. Thank you.